This is It Was a Thing on TV. Punisher! Control! Tell me before I change my mind! I give you Super Train! <laughs> Episode 341, submission number 990, Double Trouble. Double Trouble aired on NBC from April 4th, 1984 to March 30th, 1985 for 23 episodes over two seasons. There have been Twins in Trouble TV shows before Double Trouble, and there have been Twins in Trouble sitcoms since. What makes this one any different? I don't know. It's the first one to ever star actual Double Mint Twins. Double Mint, Double Mint Gum. Liz and Jean Seagal were actually... Double Mint Twins before this show came around. Not only were they Double Mint Twins, but they were actually trained dancers. And the two actually appeared in the 1982 Feel Good Sequel of the Year, Grease 2. Oh, everyone's favorite movie, Grease 2. Everybody loves Grease 2. Mike, don't you love Grease 2? Oh, absolutely love it. I've never seen it. <laughs> it's okay. Neither has anybody on the planet, so... Thank you for making me feel better, Greg. And fun fact, the Twins' Godfather fleshed out the sort of concept of this show, which was ultimately created by masters of the genre... David Duclon, Robert Ills, and James R. Stein. The Godfather was Norman Lear. There's no such thing as a fun fact. So the concept of this show? Twins getting into trouble in and around Des Moines, Iowa. While their father runs a dance studio, which gave the twins ample display of their dance skills. And also sort of a twisted home life scenario where you have this widowed father and her employee who acts as a mother figure. So put all these things together and it's all way too complicated. So let's go into what kind of trouble these twins get into. But first, let's go into who the twins are, what the family was like, and how we got from twins getting into trouble in Des Moines to twins getting into trouble in New York? Well, like we mentioned, Liz and Jean Seagal played Kate and Allison Foster. One is an ultra-serious, ultra-studious twin. The other is more laid-back, more happy-go-lucky, and more prone to antics. Their father, Art Foster, was played by Donnelly Rhodes, who, and we talked about this before the show, was a bastard on soap. Well, not in the literal sense, bastard. He was just not a good man. He was an escaped convict. He was Dutch. He played Dutch on soap. Yep. Yeah. He was also in, if you remember this on the Disney Channel... Six Years of Danger Bay. 
and also in the Battlestar Galactica reboot as Dr. Cuddle. Legendary actor here. And playing Beth McConnell, who was Art's sort of manager and the lady who ran the studio and also a surrogate mother figure to uh, Kate and Allison, Patricia Richardson. Jill Taylor from Home Improvement herself. Yeah, well, you know she was on an episode of Quantum Leap, right? No, but you're going to tell me which one. She was on the season two episode, Good Morning Piora. Oh, guys, do you know who played himself in this episode? Who played himself in this episode? Chubby Checker! That deserves a twist. Wow, that's great. And I believe this episode, he invents the twist. Yo, here's the genius about Chubby Checker, okay? He records a song called The Twist, and you think right? that's that's it. He can't That's it. That's it. There's no more. But then the next year he records a song that says, Let's twist again. And the thing of it is, that song directly references the first song. Because remember, the first song came out in the middle of the summer, then the second song was like, Let's twist again like we did last summer. Ah, oh, let's twist again. How many times have you ever seen a sequel to a song? Once. I've seen uh, Human 2, Don't Turn Your Back on Me by uh, Boys to Men, which was a sequel to Human by the Human League. Hold on a second. I think I did reference this. Tazon Day recorded a sequel to Chocolate Rain. Shut called- up. Cherry chocolate rain. Oh yeah, I do remember that. I remember. What? That. I remember that. I remember yes. That. No, I can't believe that. No, I trust you, but I, I just can't. No. <laughs> so we okay. have three instances of a sequel to a song in history that we know of. Okay, so twins in trouble in Des Moines. Obviously, there's got to be more to it than that. Let's see. Here are the episodes. The first episode, one drives, the other doesn't. Kate fails her driver's test, but borrows the car and Allison's license and gets into a little accident, which she then tries to hide. Corky. You won't believe what happened. And we have a name in this episode, playing the role of Mrs. Gilliam. Elizabeth Kerr, who is a uh, Grandma Cora on Mork and Mindy. Well, the first season of Mork and Mindy, anyway. Episode 2, Lust. Kate falls in lust with a boy at the gym and spends more time with him than she does her boyfriend. She also tells him her name is Allison. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! I guess you know by now which one's the double and which one's the trouble. By the way, uh, playing Kate's boyfriend in a recurring role, Michael Gillette is John Cleary, who would be a that guy from that 80s thing. He was in five episodes of the first season of Double Trouble, but he was in all 20 episodes of Square Pegs which I'm still debating as to whether or not we should even cover it, because it was short, but was also really good. Yeah, but we've had short and good things on this podcast before. That is true. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the reason to include it in the podcast. And playing the, (laughs) the man Kate is in lust with, Eric Cameron Dye, who is known... Oh my god, I can't believe I'm referencing this movie as Fred in 1983's Valley Girl. A.K.A. the movie that pretty much made Moon Unit Zappa's career. No, it made Nick Cage's career, silly! Him too. And also, he was on an episode of Quantum Leap as well. Oh wow. He was in season 5's Killin' Time. 
Killing Time. Episode 3. First Day. Kate's school closes down. Oh yeah, by the way, Kate attends a private school because she is a proper lady. So Kate's school closes down, and she must now attend the same school as Allison. Allison gets Kate a job on the yearbook staff to help her fit in, but Kate becomes more popular than Allison ever was, and Allison ends up being jealous. Oh, gosh. You're not going to believe who's in this episode. Playing the role of Mark, Steve Alterman. Noted voice actor Steve Alterman. He was in Grand Theft Auto 5. Hold on, guys. I just realized something. Uh Uh-huh. This is CNN Breaking News. I just discovered that Gene Seagal was on an episode of Quantum Leap. Nice. Yes, she was in the season two episode, What Price Gloria? And guess what? You know who played the mirror image uncredited in that episode of her character? Liz Seagal. Ding, 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 ding. Lucky guess. So we got four connections to Quantum Leap. Episode four. Bad chemistry. Kate takes Allison's place in the chemistry lab so Allison can go on a date but messes up the assignment so they break into the school at night to fix things. How many episodes of this show involve Kate and Allison switching bodies? I mean, I get that, you know, they're sort of mirror image twins, but, I mean, come on. Where's the effort? Hey guys, we have a name in this episode playing Miles. Is John P. Navin Jr., we talked about him previously because he was on all 13 episodes of Jennifer Slept Here. Oh, wait, I wasn't there for that episode. Oh, yeah, just because you weren't here, that episode doesn't exist in our canon. Whatever. Blame my old job for why I wasn't on that episode. Let's just say there's a reason why it's just the three of us since episode five. Thank you, Greg's old employer. Episode 5, Dueling Feet. It's that kind of episode. Oh, wait, no, it's not that kind of episode. I thought it was... And Never mind what I thought. The twins enter a dance contest, but Kate sprains her ankle while attempting to spy on the competition, leaving Allison to represent the family. So, yeah, this is basically an excuse for uh, Liz and Jean to show off their incredibly awesome dancing skills. And John Cleary returns as Michael, but in the role of the judge, Betty Ackerman, who's been on everything from Ben Casey in the 60s to Trapper John in the 80s. But yeah, this is one of those one of those uh, famous old time Hollywood actresses who's just done everything. Absolutely everything. Hey, we have another name, and this is a big name, playing the host of the dance competition, Jeff Edwards. Oh, who did he play in this episode? He played the host of the dancing contest. Oh, what a stretch. Jeff Edwards played a host named The Host. It was indeed a stretch, wasn't it? And we should mention at this time, Jeff Edwards... Just getting off of Starcade. 40th anniversary of it this year. Yeah. Yay. Other known entities on this particular episode. Kimberly Foster, who was on 50 episodes of Dallas, and Claudette Wells, who was on the entire run of Square Pegs. My guess is rival dancers. Episode 6. Separate Birthdays. Allison decides to live away from Kate for a week. Because ultimately, if you have a show featuring twins, you're going to want an episode that features the twins living separate lives for a bit. Playing a waiter in this episode, Dan 
freshman, the Dan from head of the class who isn't a creep. Well, that's good. Although I will say, I did watch Good Burger yesterday on Paramount Plus, which is what you do on a Thursday night. Apparently, you watch Good Burger on Paramount Plus, and I will say, it still holds up. Oh, and by the way, I didn't realize Linda Cordellini was the girl in the uh, in the crazy place that had a thing for Ed. Is there anything Linda Cardellini can't do? No. I'm just wondering why Greg didn't say it to me. You need to see Good Burger because Ava Goda's in it. I will say Ava Goda is the Tony Shalhoub of Good Burger. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> we also have Fred Holiday playing the role of Professor Whitmore, known for six episodes of the original FBI. Not the reboot that is currently airing. The one from the 60s. Right. The original FBI, which has a sequel, which is a future entry, Today's FBI. Episode 7, Heartache. Allison considers having an intimate relationship. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> It's not going to be with uh, Michael because he's obviously with Kate. Maybe with this guy named Stephen, who is played by Harry Crosby, who is known as Bill in the original Friday the 13th. Episode 8, The Bombshell. Art plans to announce his relationship with Beth. Because, you know, all the season long, Beth has been acting like a mother figure to the twins, and Art and Beth have been sort of flirtatious, but not necessarily serious about it. Next thing you know, hey guys, guess what? We're in a family way now, for realsies. Oh. And in this episode, playing the role of Karen, Linda Henning. Now, the name isn't familiar, but her father is. Her father is Paul Henning, legendary TV producer and writer. And perhaps that's how she landed the role of Betty Jo on Petticoat Junction. So That's Linda K. Henning there. And that was season one. And I'm going to look on the schedule here. Because we have to look at the schedule. It was on Wednesday nights at 9.30 after the Facts of Life. Which would be a very solid lead-in. There was just one problem. It was on opposite Dynasty. Uh Uh-oh! Uh-oh. You are going to attract an audience, but not the Dynasty audience. But the thing of it is, because Facts of Life was on in that hour, too, the shows kind of sort of meshed well with each other. And the show itself didn't do bad enough to warrant cancellation. But it also didn't do well enough to, you know, say, hey, let's get more episodes. Because it was a mid-season show. So it didn't garner high enough ratings. But here's the thing. People loved the twins. They weren't so enamored with familial antics, but they did love the twins. So how do we solve this problem? This looks like a job for a retooling. They are going to retool the series and set the twins in New York. Because there's only so much you can do in Des Moines before you kind of get old and busted. We have to have new adventures in a new place. And we have to have these twins going on, you know, following their dreams. 
in a new place. So that's what they're going to do. And we'll see who they do it with right after these era-appropriate commercials. This is the NBC Television Network. You can NBC there, be there. Tonight, the A-Team hits the beach for some fun and to get the job done. Why we don't go up there and just kick some butts? The A-Team, and on an all-new Riptide, the guys face Nazis. I got it, disarm! Who want to turn Murray into Big Buzinski. And it's an all-new Remington Steel with a psycho killer and a deadly chase. Tonight. Tonight on Late Night, where can Carl Reiner feel just as comfortable as he would in his own living room? Right here on NBC, the network of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. Natural Wonder says, take your nails to the top. With new improved Natural Wonder Super Nails, it wears 50% longer because now it's 50% stronger. It's tough, but flexible. No chipping, no peeling. Goes for days without a touch-up. Now your nails can stay beautiful 50% longer because Natural Wonder is 50% stronger. New improved Super Nails by Natural Wonder. Natural Wonder. tune is back. This fall, match wits when contestants name their favorite songs in battles for $100,000 in cash and prizes. Here are the keys to your brand new car. It's up. Join host Jim Lang on the new $100,000 Name That Tune, premiering September 15th at 7.30. Oh, Thursday on Sears, Sam brings his fastball out of retirement. I'm particularly looking forward to the shower afterwards. Cheers. And on Night Court, what's it about Selma that brings out the animal in men? Love can be sickening, can it? And on Hill Street, will J.D.'s undercover tapes have him up on charges? What'd you do, charge 50 cents a head? Thursday. Welcome back. Or if you're just tuning in, where have you been? So before the break, we talked about how everybody loved the twins, but nobody loved the show. Mostly because it was on opposite Dynasty and all the kids were watching Dynasty. Even though with the Facts of Life lead in, there was an audience for this show. And NBC didn't want to cancel it just yet, so they decided to rejigger the show and give it another shot next season, also as a mid-season replacement. Gone were Donnelly Rhodes and Patricia Richardson, so if you are hoping for anything to come out of that relationship, sorry. But we do have a responsible adult figure living with the twins. Their Aunt Margot. Aunt Margot was played by Barbara Barry a.k.a. Barney Miller's wife. And joining the cast is Michael D. Roberts as a character named Mr. Arecchia. Michael D. Roberts, known as Tyrone C. Earl, in a show that we reference a lot on this show. Wow! Manimal. And rounding out the cast... James Vallely as Charles Kincaid. He was a writer and producer for Arrested Development, among other things. Jonathan Schmock, an actor, director, producer, writer, and cartoonist who plays Billy Badalato. And Anne Marie Johnson, who was on the last season of In Living Color, and also What's Happening Now, and also In the Heat of the Night. In the heat of the night. And they also had a new theme song, which we'll play here.
that was basically Liz and Jean's love letter to New York City, it looks like. So let's go into the second season, the New York season, because nobody ever remembers the Des Moines season. Episode one, if we can make it here, the twins move to New York to live with their aunt. Yep, that's it. That's the episode. Okay, that's the episode. They yeah, but here's it. the thing. What? Uh, David Duclon would stay on as writer, but they would bring in Don Rio, who created Blossom. Whoa, whoa. Already we're going hard on the rejiggering. Episode two. Do you believe in magic? Kate tries to help her boss, a washed up magician. Is it the magician from Super Train? Sadly, no. This is uh, another washed up magician. Oh, well, I don't care. This magician was Rollo the Great, played by the great Carl Ballantyne. Was he responsible for the beer Ballantyne beer? No. We talked was... about him. Oh, we no, did? we talked about him. Yes, we did. When? He was the world. It was the world's greatest magician. In what? He was Max Kellerman in One in a Million. Oh, okay. One in a Million. He was not that Max Kellerman. Another guy named Max Kellerman. Yes. He also played uh, innkeeper and waiter in two episodes of When Things Were Rotten and Merlin in an episode of The Ghostbusters. That's cool. But if only he hosted a show with Keyshawn Johnson. Kids would recognize his voice as the voice of Al J. Swindler on Garfield and Friends. Yeah, we referenced Garfield and Friends on this show. Episode 3, Dream Girls. A rock singer offers Kate a job on the road. The said rock singer, Nick Rush, played by John Scott Cloth. I know I messed that name up, and I'm sorry. He, too, was on an episode of Quantum Leap. So if we're keeping score, that's now five people that were on Quantum Leap? Yes. Okay, what episode? Uh, that would be season five's Memphis Melody. Okay, that's the next to last episode of the original show, where you're not going to believe this, okay? Sam meets a young Bill Clinton. Yes. Oh, I think he leaps into Elvis in this episode. Sam leaps into Elvis. Sam leaps into Elvis. And he meets a young Bill Clinton. And he meets a young Bill Clinton. This explains a lot now. <laughs> the jokes write themselves, folks. Yes. And, and I'm not going to leave you out either, Mike. He was on three episodes of Night Court. I want to hear about him playing uh, Elvis and uh, and meeting young Bill Clinton. Okay. No, I really want to hear more about that. I want to hear about this, too. Let me see what I can do here. Okay, here it is. While impersonating the king, Elvis Presley, Sam must save a Memphis Belle from a bad marriage. So where does Bill Clinton come into play? I'm trying to figure that one out. Oh, it's like a little seed where he meets a young Bill Clinton. It's not, like, central to the plot, but... It's not even in one of the uh, credits here. No, it's like a blinkle your miss it scene. Oh, oh, that's bullshit. Sorry. But you know who was in that episode? Who? That bastard, Gregory Itson. What? Played Sam Phillips. Oh, well, then Why, he, he was... played Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips. Did he bust Elvis's kneecap while at Sun Records? <laughs> Maybe that's in the Elvis movie with Tom Hanks. By the way, the sax player, Little Billy C. of Hope, Arkansas. Yeah. Billy C. of Hope, Arkansas. Little Billy C. Little Billy C. Could you imagine the alternate reality where Sam made a musician instead of a... instead of the president? Oh, boy. I see what you did there. Episode four. Oh, come all ye faithful. 
three guesses what this show's about. Seriously, nothing? Oh, I have an idea what this show's about, but I'm not going to say it. Okay. Kate and Allison are homesick at Christmas. Is that what you were thinking? No. Oh. Based on the title, I was thinking something else. Mike knows where Greg, I was going. Greg, you sicko. No, Greg, you are a sick man. No. Bad. Bad. Go in the corner. Oh, oh come all you faithful. Oh, I geez. didn't say it. You were implying <laughs> it close enough. I masturbate a lot. Episode 5. Man for Margot. The twins try to find Mr. Right for Aunt Margot. Do we know who Mr. Right is? Well, no. Well, it's we one of two people. One of two people, yes. It's either the person played by Steve Suskind, who is known as the voice of the floor manager on Monsters, Inc., among other things, or the man played by Robert Hogan, who is known for Paul Diamante in two episodes of Batman 66. Batman 66? Batman 66. Oh, Batman 66. I thought it was like a prequel to Jake and the Fat Man. No, but you're giving people ideas now. Someone should make a prequel to Jake and the Fat Man. How great would that have been? Fat Man 66. Mike, you'd watch it. Well, was that before he ate the cheese Danish? <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I can go over here and see what happened at the murder scene because I didn't eat the cheese Danish yet. And now, back to Jake and the Fat Man. Hey, look over here on the carpet. That's a cigarette butt. This is probably evidence. Oh. What do you think was in that Danish? You think it was cheese? Because I uh, I got a little problem with cheese. Hey, I'm talking about evidence here. There's lipstick on it. Yeah, well, can you bring it over to me? I can't move it. This is a crime scene. Well, uh, well can you describe it to me? You know what? Forget it. I'll take care of this, okay? Oh, no, 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 no. Just... Uh, just, uh, just, just let me close my eyes for a minute. Look, I know his wife is a smoker. Just yesterday, when we saw her at the country club, she had a cigarette in her hand. Just remember, he has a problem with cheese. Uh, yeah, he does. Okay, so, he was also in an episode of... Oh, sorry, oh, no, do, do it again, because... I was doing his snoring after. Oh, I can't take you people anywhere. Mike, you're so dead now because my fat pants. I literally thought she goes said fat pants 66. I was Which like, is what? One of the great errors ever in this show's history. <laughs> fat man 66. Okay. That's what happens when you mix Weight Watchers and Route 66. <laughs> uh, he was also in an episode. Can't believe we're bringing this one up. Turnabout. Jeez. But to make it up to you, he was also in an episode of Auto Man. Oh, that's good. And we will talk about him later this year. Oh, damn. I thought you were going to say he was in Fat Man, the animated series. (laughs) Oh, my God. Goodness gracious. Oh my good goodness gracious. Of all the dramatic things I've ever seen. Can't take us anywhere. No, I really can't. Episode 6. The Boy Next Door. Billy and Allison go to an awards ceremony. Yeah, they want nothing to happen, but something's totally going to happen. Episode 7. Kate and Allison recall their high school days. Alright, so we've established that they've moved on from high school and are now grown-ups. Or as grown-up as you could be when you're living with your aunt. 
the Memories episode aired January 19th, 1985, or my fifth birthday. I got a clip show for my fifth birthday, y'all. Episode 8, Two Girls for Every Boy. Kate's perfect man falls for Allison instead. Quirky? You won't believe what happened. Unfortunately, I do not have a listing for who plays the perfect man, but I do have Cousin Harley, played by Michael Young, who was last seen on the soundtrack for Pitch Perfect 2. Hold on. Don't even... No, no, no. Okay, hold on. I want to hear what Gray's going to say, but I have the perfect credit for him, but I'm going to let Greg speak first. Hold on. You said Michael Young. Are you talking about the Texas Rangers baseball player, Michael Young? No. Why did I let Greg speak first? I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I should have just like, like, Mike, talked over Mike, him. Mike, save us. Mike, please save us. People of a certain age, like my age, would remember him because he hosted Kids or People too. He did. But yes, also, he, he was on two weeks of Celebrity Few. Yes, he was. And he was also in Future Entry, No Soap Radio. And not to make Greg feel some sort of way, he was on an episode of the new Love American style. Ah, oh, yes! The new Love American style! Because as we all know, the old Love American style, that can go f*** itself. We're now in the 80s, and it's the new Love American style. This is where it's at. It's all new. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew Greg was so passionate about new Love American style. Because f*** the old Love American style. It's all about the new Love American style. All I know is that the old Love American style did not have Arsenio Hall in it. Damn straight! <sighs> Episode 9. The right stuff. That's the right as in W-R-I-T-E scribble, 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 right stuff. Allison's fashion article in the school newspaper gets rave reviews, prompting her to consider a career switch. So now they're going to school in New York? Which, you know, that would, okay, that, now that makes sense. They've done their time in Des Moines, now they're going to school in New York. Episode 10, Commercial Break. Allison steps in for voiceless Kate. At an audition. Oh boy. Episode 11. Old movies. The twins, the boys, and Margot have movie fantasies. I could not tell you what these movie fantasies are. Good. Episode 12. September song. Allison's mysterious new beau invites her to Paris. And the mysterious new beau, David Burke, played by David Hedison. I'm going to question that, Chico, because do you see how old David Hedison would have been in 1985? Uh, That would be 50... 50 50-something. Okay, regardless, the 50 is all I'm worried about. And he's going out with a teenager? Hmm. That That's would what I'm be, saying. That would be troublesome. So, yeah. I don't think he's the bow, but I do think he is mysterious. But remember, I think we talked about him because he was in Flying High, right? Yes. Okay. Now, I did mention he played Felix Leiter in James Bond in License to Kill and Live and Let Die, because I mentioned when they did the novel adaptation of License to Kill that they had to keep it in continuity with the upper Bond novels, because in the novelization of Live and Let Die, he's being eaten by a shark, and then in License to Kill, he's being eaten by a shark again. And so James Bond's like, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe my best friend got eaten by a shark twice. What are the odds? <laughs> Episode 13, Funny Girl. A wealthy classmate befriends Allison, 
playing said wealthy classmates. Are you ready for this, boys? Okay, who is the wealthy classmate? Uh, Janie Blakemore is her name, and she is played by Mindy Cohn. Wow. Natalie herself on the Facts of Life. Doing double duty. Nice. Episode 14, The Day of the Rose. The twins treat Margot to a holiday weekend. Playing a bellman on this episode, Patrick Cranshaw, who played Sheriff Bob in no more than three Air Bud direct to video films. I never thought we'd have a mention to the Air Bud direct to video films on this podcast. He was also in all 18 episodes as Bob Scannell of Aftermath. Hey, two more guys. This is the second episode in a row we've mentioned this show. He was on an episode of Salvage One. This is great. Two straight episodes with a Salvage One reference. Well, hold on. Well, Greg, if you enjoyed a Salvage One reference in two straight shows, you're going to go off the wall when you hear this one. He played a man dying in an elevator in the Gong Show movie. (laughs) What a great role. Man dying in an elevator in the Gong Show movie. Hold on a second. I got a question. Did he run into Diana Muldor in the elevator? Oh, no. Oh, no. Not a Pulaski episode. I really don't want to talk about it. Mike, you set up the joke and Grand Slam. I see you got a solid base hit, but whatever. He turned that into a Pulaski reference. What the heck? And now the final episode from March. Oh, thank 30- heavens. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. No. And now the final episode. Where's Papa? Guess who's come to visit? That bastard Donnelly Rhodes? That bastard Donnelly Rhodes has come to visit. Oh, I thought with a title like Where's Papa that Matthew Modine was going to have a cameo in this. I see what you did there, Greg. And that is the show. We're going to revisit the schedule because for season two, they put it on Saturday nights at 830 after different strokes. And this is a week different strokes, right? I want to say Pet Ultimate season on NBC different strokes. Yeah, you're right. Second to last NBC season, Chico. All right. So, again, it has an audience, but it doesn't really garner a rating on a Saturday. I mean, who's watching TV on a Saturday? Bet you if viewers wait a year. They'll watch four old ladies on a Saturday night. Just saying. Mm, Yeah. Here's what you are watching on December of 1984. You start out with different strokes. Then you go into double trouble. Then give me a break. So solid 90 minutes there. Then Spencer, which I want to say I remember, but I don't. And you end with Partners in Crime with uh, Linda Carter and Lonnie Anderson. And airing opposite Double Trouble and Different Strokes, TJ Hooker and Airwolf. And unless those are reruns, Different Strokes and Double Trouble are not beating them. Or maybe they are, because Different Strokes got a 16 on the first uh, Saturday of 1985. And Double Trouble got a 14.9. T.J. Hooker ended up with a 13.6, and Airwolf had a 13.2. So, respectable rating opposite these two heavies. But I have to wonder, if it was doing really well, and if CBS decides to, you know, move Airwolf for the equally short-running Otherworld, 
why did Double Trouble get canceled? The world may never know. In the 1983-1984 season, there were 101 TV shows. Does anybody want to guess where Double Trouble ended up? Somewhere in the 70s. 69. <laughs> Nice. And not take you any place. In 71st. And they renewed it while it was in 71st. Interestingly enough, uh, the show that placed in 69th, Greg, we've already talked about. Domestic Life. Oh. Not bad, but definitely not something to write home about. So we're going to go from that to 1985 ratings and there were 77 shows in 84 85 guess where double trouble ranked 65th mike 58th mike you were closest again and you will not believe me if i tell you it was a tie for 43rd wow I will tell you all of the shows that tied for 43rd, only one of which was renewed. T.J. Hooker, The Dukes of Hazard, Magruder and Loud, Street Hawk, Fallops, Bleeps and Blunders, and Double Trouble. T.J. Hooker. That was the only yeah, show that be was T.J. Renewed. Hooker. Because that was the last season of Dukes of Hazard, and yeah. Was that the Coy and Vance season? No, they had one more season with uh, the proper Dukes. Okay, good. So it did respectable. But I imagine that there's going to be a bit of fence straddling on NBC's part because this was basically uh, Brandon Tartikoff seeing, hey, I wonder what's going to happen here. And I'm looking at the 1985 Saturday schedule. I see why they opted for uh, something else. Because 1985, fall of 1985, would be the first season for 227, Four Ladies from Washington, D.C., and also Four Ladies from Miami. That Saturday schedule, which would hold up incredibly well. Give me a break. The Facts of Life, The Golden Girls, and 227. You see The Golden Girls, you see Promise. You see 227, you see Promise. You see Double Trouble, you see No Promise. But hey, it was not for lack of trying. There was only so much space on the schedule. But do not cry for the careers of Liz and Jean Seagal. They're doing fine. Jean has been the director for so many solid shows nowadays. Two and a Half Men, Two Broke Girls, Mom, Last Man Standing, and Fuller House. Sister Liz, she's also doing fine. She's more of a writer nowadays. She's written for Lost in Space, the reboot, Da Vinci's Demons, Sons of Anarchy, Charmed, Two Guys, a Girl in a Pizza Place, Brotherly Love, Cowboy Bebop, The Flight Attendant, and Monk. Monk! Well, you know who was on Monk. I know who was on Monk. That's right, Tony Shalhoub. And as we all know from episode 300... For the first time ever, I said that I loved Wings and that it made Tony Shalhoub's career. Can you believe, guys, that it's now been 41 episodes since I mentioned for the first time ever on this podcast, I love Wings? I know. It's been a while. Fun fact, I mentioned Sons of Anarchy, created by her brother-in-law, Kurt Sutter. And starring her sister, Katie Seagal. The Seagal twins are doing fine. Uh, the show has been 
unofficially released on DVD, if you know where to look. The show is also available online to stream, also if you know where to look. Did you hear the wink? Wink. Yeah. And there you go. We had twins getting into troubles, setting the plate for such filler as Sister Sister, which is not filler, it's actually awesome. Picking up the slack for the Patty Duke show, setting the table for Sister Sister, and all the while, because this did air in reruns on USA for a while, probably longer than it did on a uh, network, but all the while giving us this thing on TV. We're going to get into some trouble of our own by uploading this to our website. It was a thing on TV.com. You'll find all of our episodes there. All of our live watches, all of our mini sodes, links to all of our socials at It Was a Thing on TV on all the socials except for Facebook because somebody played Twin to us and took It Was a Thing on TV. So we're left with It Was a Thing on TV podcast. You can go there. And if you're also on the YouTube, we're there. Just don't forget to like, subscribe. Smash the notification bell so you can stay up to date with all of our entries. Including what we have for later this week, because we have a mini-show to talk about. We love our commercials, but this one, I don't think we can find a place for it on the schedule, so we're just going to go ahead and cover it this week, because it is kind of sort of weird. And also, it's a makeup from a mini-show. And next week, a couple of questions to ponder. First, we're going to ask, what happens when a character dies? And then we're going to ask, what happens when the star dies? And if we have time, we're going to ask, what happens when a star wants to leave for their own show, and you get Jim Caldwell to replace them? All of that is coming in the week ahead, right here on It Was a Thing on TV. Well, Thank hold you. on, guys. Oh, before I, hold on. Before I do the roar, guys. Okay. Now, last week, Chica, we did a live show for uh-huh. WCW Starcade 95, right? Yes, we did. It was awesome. Well, for the first time ever. On this podcast, we're going to do an eBay Prices Right that's not related to this episode. So let's play the music. Okay, guys, you are going to be bidding on this item that I got today in the mail. It is a Just Toys. WCW Bendham of Lex Luger. For some reason in green trunks. I don't know why he's in green trunks. I don't remember him ever wearing green trunks. But okay. I got this today. You're going to be bidding on what I paid for it in a buy it now offer. Not the buy it now price. Just the offer. Okay. Okay. So you made a best offer and he accepted. Yes. Now, I know Greg doesn't like money, so I'm going to guess $50. Mike? I know Greg doesn't like money, but I don't think he's going to pay that much. I'm going to severely undercut you and say $5. Six ninety nine. For oh, serious? Yes. And, you know, it was seven ninety nine, so I, I got it for a dollar cheaper. And with free shipping, too. This is going to make a nice piece. But that's not the reason why I'm doing this, okay? I want to mention that there was a WCW Bendham in Argentina for El Gante. It was an Argentinian exclusive for El Gante, a Bendham. And you know what? Sadly, he does not have the belt. But, but he wants the belt. He wants the belt. But guess what? For the first time ever, we're doing a non-eBay prices right not related to this episode. <laughs> so play the sexy sax music.
okay, guys, you are going to be bidding on this item I saw at Milo Toys and Collectibles in Oakdale, New York now. It is a WWF Hasbro figure of the giant Gonzalez El Gigante himself. He has this mean mug on his face. Like, ugh, I want to bet. Okay, Mike, I'm going to start the bidding with you. Okay, is this the Argentinian import? No, this is another figure. This is the WWF Hasbro figure. This was released oh, in the okay. States. Not like the WCW Bendem, so. Okay, oh, okay, okay. Oh, boy. Uh, hmm. You know, I bid $14 on it if he had a belt, but without a belt, I'm going to drop it down to 10 10 Chico. I'm going to bid $14 if he's not going to bid $14. Well, okay. You assume there's a belt there then. Okay. I see what you're doing. $25. Okay, I I'll want say, yeah, the belt. Bucks. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was going to be like like $30. So I, I know Greg didn't buy it, but also at the same time, we all know Greg and money have a love-hate relationship. He, he loves to hate keeping it. I did get a Roddy Piper figure, though. And just Is it remember, from LJN or no? It's a Hasbro. Oh, nice. I don't mean to break this to you, what? but if you take a look at the second picture that you sent us, oh. you can see the price. You can see it says 20 something. So you could probably make out 25 there because there's a corner. You gave us the price. You should have looked at the full picture. I didn't even see it. That's why I said I'm looking at it full screen. And you can see it says 1994 Hasbro Giant Gonzala. And then it says uh, there's a dollar sign, a two, and you can see a corner there. Uh, so you know it's got to be like a five. If we just l- looked at it full screen, we would have had the price, Chico. Come on. We uh, blew it. Blew it. Good Can't job believe. editing that, Greg. But look at Andre the Giant. Right He's behind. just staring into space, the Andre the Giant. And the big, bo- the big boss man there. Oh, the, the big, big boss, boss man, man is like staring into space. Oh yeah, the big boss man's like, oh, whatever. In about like nine years or so, I'm gonna cook house those talk on SmackDown, and I'm gonna admit to the Big Show's mom that the Big Show was a bastard. Oh my! And Andre the Giant there looks like somebody said to him just out of the blue, "Hey, turn around!" And he just took a picture, huh? You want me to turn around? What? No, it's not. It's, it's Andre the Giant, not Tom Poston. Well, I was say, apparently, Andre the Giant was doing his Tom Poston impersonation. Anybody want a peanut? Stop that rhyming now. I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Okay, yeah, but that does it for now. And we'll see you with that mini soap later on this weekend. Wow! Prepare for trouble and make it double. Jesse James. <laughs> Team Rocket, last off at the speed of light. Surrender now or prepare to fight. Uh, Me. Okay. That's right. Bob of that. 